Buenas a todos. Bueno, seguimos con este eh, simposio sobre bienestar y neurociencias. Y ahora viene uno de los platos fuertes de la tarde con el doctor Richard Davidson. Pero antes de escucharlos, quería recordarles, hay gente que todavía está siguiendo la conferencia por YouTube. La plataforma ya se encuentra perfectamente habilitada y en la plataforma se puede escuchar en castellano, en inglés, se puede ir a los distintos pabellones. Tenemos más de 15.000 personas inscriptas, así que aprovechen esta oportunidad. So now I'm going to start speaking in English because we have the honor of having Professor Richard Davidson with us. He's Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry and founder and director of the Center for Healthy Minds, University of Wisconsin, Madison. His main topic of research is to promote human flourishing, including meditation and related contemplative practices. I was mentioning before that he's one of the stars from this symposium. He has more than 440 articles, 14 books, and he was elected to the famous National Academy of Medicine in the year 2017. So I will stop speaking and I let you with the honor of having Richard here with us to talk about resilience and the pillars of well-being to face the challenges of COVID-19. Thank you so much, Julian. Uh, it is an honor to be with you all today. Uh, I apologize for not being able to speak with you in Spanish. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I'm very happy to be here and share a little bit about our work and how it may be relevant, particularly to the challenges that we face in the current pandemic. Uh, one of the central questions that has motivated the research that we do from the very beginning has been this. Why is it that some people are more vulnerable to life's slings and arrows, life's challenges? And why are other people more resilient? And how can we nurture the qualities of our mind that can promote increased resilience and increased flourishing? And in the early part of my career, I focused mostly on the adversity side of the equation. I studied the brain mechanisms that conferred vulnerability to anxiety and depression and stress-related disorders. And then in 1992, I had the honor of first meeting His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who challenged me. And he said, look, you've been using tools of modern neuroscience to study depression and anxiety and stress and fear. Why can't you use those same tools, he asked, to study kindness and to study compassion? And it was a wake up call for me. Uh, and I made a commitment to him on that day in 1992 that I was going to do everything I could to put qualities like compassion squarely on the scientific agenda. And uh, one of the wonderful things that we can say today is there is now a vibrant uh, area of research focused on these positive qualities, which are all part of our understanding of well being. I'd like to begin uh, by reminding the audience that this work that we and others do on well being is actually predicated on a foundation of basic scientific research that enables this work to go forward. And I'd just like to mention a couple of really important insights from modern science that provides a foundation for all of this. So one of those uh, insights is related to neuroplasticity. This idea that the brain changes in response to experience and in response to training. Uh, I often say that the brain is changing constantly. Uh, it's changing wittingly or unwittingly 
Uh, in other words, uh, it is changing through forces that are around us that are shaping our brains. And a lot of the time, we have no idea what those forces actually are, nor do we have very much control over them. But we also know that by cultivating healthy habits of mind, we can actually change our brains. And that's the, uh, the really unique insight of uh, what we call contemplative neuroscience, uh, the study of how the brain changes in response to simple contemplative practices that uh, can be taught in a completely secular way uh, that we and other scientists find change the brain. And it's those changes in the brain that enable the transformation to occur and enable uh, enduring change to occur. Uh, and so we have been led to a very simple but very radical conclusion from this work. Uh, and the conclusion is that well being is actually a skill. Uh, we can actually cultivate well being by nourishing these positive qualities of our mind which we and others have found changes our brain, which can then confer uh, certain advantages. For example, can improve resilience. And I'll talk a little bit more about that specifically in a few minutes. But I'd like to uh, uh, name another uh, foundational insight from modern science that provides a foundation for this work and it is the equivalent of neuroplasticity in the realm of genomics. Uh, and that is epigenetics. Epigenetics is the science of how our genes are regulated. Uh, and we can think of genes, most genes having little volume controls that influence the extent to which the gene is turned on or turned off. And uh, we know that there are many factors which can influence the epigenetic status uh, of our genes. Uh, it, uh, can inc it includes environmental factors, our emotional demeanor. We know, for example, that the way a mother behaves toward her offspring can induce epigenetic changes in the offspring, which then can persist for quite a long time. And we and others have found that training our mind can induce epigenetic changes. And those changes can be very important in regulating our neural circuits and also in regulating our systemic biology, biology that may be important for our health and vulnerability to physical illnesses. So, let me share with you a framework that we've developed for understanding what we think of as the plasticity of well being. Uh, this framework holds that there are four major pillars of well being, and each of these pillars has been intensively investigated in scientific research. Uh, and also, these pillars uh, have another important characteristic. They all have appeared in one way or another in some of the uh, most uh, important uh, contemplative traditions that we have. And uh, they are pillars of well being around which technologies for training the mind have been developed. So let me share with you what these four pillars of well being are. The first pillar is awareness. And awareness refers to our capacity to regulate our attention and also our capacity for what psychologists and neuroscientists have called meta-awareness. Meta-awareness is our ability to know what our mind is doing. How many of you know what your mind is doing? That may seem like a strange question, but most people have had the experience, I certainly have, of reading a book where we read each word on a page and we may read one page, we may read a second page. And after a few minutes, 
we realize that we have absolutely no idea what we've just read. Our minds are somewhere else. We're lost. Could be in a daydream or a fantasy. And the moment we recognize that our mind is lost, that's a moment of meta-awareness. And we can bring our mind back to whatever it is that we were doing. So that's awareness. Now, why is awareness important? A study that was published 10 years ago, a very famous study that was published in Science, a very prestigious journal, uh, it included a sample of about 3,500 people across different parts of the world. And with participants' permission, they were texted multiple times a day on their smartphones, and they were asked three questions. The first question is, what are you doing right now? And they had to check off from a list of activities. Second question is, where is your mind right now, right at the moment you got the text? And the third question is, right at this moment, how happy or unhappy are you right now? And the finding from this study is that on average, the average adult spends 47% of her or his waking life not paying attention to what they're doing. 47% of the time. Now, my strong conviction is that we can do better. We can do better. We can train our minds to be more present. The other finding from this study is that when people reported that they were not paying attention to what they were doing, they were significantly less happy. Even if what they were doing was boring, even if what they were doing was cleaning their house, doing the laundry, taking out the garbage, didn't matter. When they were distracted, they were less happy. The title of this scientific paper is a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. And so this is why awareness is such a key pillar of well-being. The second pillar of well-being is connection. And connection refers to the qualities that promote or that are important for healthy social relationships. Qualities like appreciation, and gratitude, and kindness, empathy, compassion, those are all qualities that are really important for healthy social relationships. And it turns out that it doesn't take much to actually be able to train people to enhance these qualities through simple mental exercises. We did a study that was published a few years ago where we showed that in a randomized controlled trial, that people who were assigned to a condition where they engaged in this simple mental exercise that came from a simple meditation practice, but taught in a completely secular way to cultivate compassion, people who did that 30 minutes a day for two weeks, total of seven hours of practice, we put people in the MRI scanner before and after the two weeks of practice, and we showed that you can change your brain in seven hours. You can see measurable changes in the brain. And those changes in the brain were associated with people behaving more altruistically after this kind of training. So this is, a, again, uh, another reason why we consider this to be a skill which can be enhanced through training. The third pillar of well-being we call insight. And insight refers to self-knowledge. We all carry around a narrative in our minds about ourselves. And there are some people on the extreme of a distribution who have a very negative self-narrative. They have negative self-beliefs. And they actually hold those beliefs to be a true description of who they are. And of course, we know that that is a prescription for depression. And so part of well-being is not so much changing this narrative, but it's changing our relationship to the narrative. 
so that we understand the narrative for what it is. The narrative is a constellation of thoughts. And if we can appreciate, appreciate that it is a constellation of thoughts, we can get some distance from it so that it doesn't completely hijack our mind. And it turns out that this uh, uh, pillar of well-being is especially important for insight, uh, for uh, resilience. And I'll say more about that uh, in, a, in a moment. The fourth pillar of well-being is purpose. One purpose. minute, Richard. Okay. Uh, the fourth pillar of well-being is purpose, and purpose is about uh, finding one's true north, uh, one's sense of direction in life, and aligning our everyday behavior to that sense of purpose. So let me end by saying the cultivation of each of these pillars of well-being is really important for resilience. Some may be more important than others. When human beings first evolved on this planet, none of us were brushing our teeth. Today, I'm sure every one of you who's watching brushes your teeth. We know it's important for our personal physical hygiene. What I'm suggesting is that there are simple mental exercises that are important for our mental hygiene. And if we spent even as short a time as we spend brushing our teeth, nourishing our mind every day, this world would be a very different place. So please join us on this journey. Please go to our website uh, if you wish to learn more. We have an app called the Healthy Minds Program, which is freely available throughout the world that uh, has practices to cultivate each of these four pillars of well-being. And I'm happy to take a few questions. Okay, Richard, thank you very much. This is why I mentioned before that he's a star. I think it was an astonishing presentation. And Richard, let me ask you, uh, you mentioned resilience and that we have the, capa the capacity of building resilience. Do we have any evidence that there are pharmacological treatments that could also increase resilience? Uh, I would say that at the present point in time, uh, there, to the best of my knowledge, no pharmacological treatment that would really increase resilience. Uh, I would say that the best way to increase resilience and uh, more broadly to say that the best way to change specific circuits in the brain is through mental practice, through behavioral practice treatment, we can actually produce a more specific biological effect in the brain by doing specific mental exercises than we can do through any pharmaceutical. Pharmaceuticals are blunt instruments, and we can produce a more specific effect by training our mind. Well, Richard, it was a great honor and pleasure. Thank you for your time, and we are very grateful with you for all your knowledge and all that you communicate to us. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Bueno, y la próxima mesa es sobre bienestar en el trabajo en el contexto de la nueva normalidad que va a ser coordinada por el por Alejandro Melamed, que es el director de Humanize Consulting. Así que en dos minutitos estamos empezando con la última mesa.